Greetings there everyone and welcome back to Tino, the last days of Kem Kamaki Nichiro. Not quite, but uh, we're, this time we're going down the route where Kamai is going to say by me, for me, because of me. Patriots have nothing to fear. Although the presence of dissidents on the streets is a concern to us, it is merely a minute fraction of Guangdong's total population ensuring that no major functions of the state are hampered due to it. Keeping the rest of the populace in check is of the utmost importance. As such, we shall provide them with promises and assurances and shower them with the prospects of reward. The media and our postal service shall be instructed to deliver messages meant to provide our citizens with an incentive to remain loyal and obedient. Although it is disappointing that the people still do not completely and willingly adhere to our chief executive's admirable design, we will do what is needed to maintain that design. The people will have to live with it, for reality is held in our hands. We offer a bargain, work with Kamai, and reap the rewards. It's not necessary to say what happens to those who don't cooperate. Push forward himself, his own system, and, and we'll get more stability. Yay! If you want to read, uh, we're watching again, please go ahead, but... Hope. It was a grim evening in Guangdong, the oil crisis was biting, the repression was ever harsh, and the hope was dying even more than it already had. Yet one young man came back to his family's apartment unusually happy. Um, his father was curious, after all, what reason for happiness exists in the city of Guangdong these days, and asked, What got you so happy, son? Look at this, the son said, waving a piece of paper. It's a letter from the government. The son continued talking while his father rolled his eyes. There's a lot of important stuff here, Dad. Tax breaks, other economic benefits, stuff that will really bring economic growth back, but there's a condition. We need to make sure we support the government in the times of crisis. Doesn't that sound fair, Dad? His father mumbled, I guess so. The son, how, son somehow perked up more and shared his last bit of good news. You've been getting one soon enough, that's what they told me at work. Isn't it great? I'm sure it is, the father said enthusiastically. Mumbling a dismissal, he turned away to distract himself from his son's fall as the headache began to throb. I've seen government promises before, he thought. I just never expected my own son would be fool enough to think, foolish enough to think this kind of promise would change anything. Ah, oh, well, what can I really do? Notch off a few zeros. The oil crisis of a malicious and vile servant, wrapping its horrible slithery form around the immaculate and pristine Pearl Guangdong, threatening the brilliant design of our astute chief executive. The despicable servant ravages all, but there's one particular subset of people who, to which it has, a taken, has taken a liking for. The poor. The poor and needy of Guangdong have always been a nuisance and a center of disobedience and dissent. When the oil crisis descended upon the three pearls, a new titan, in order for us to discourage unproductive drug society from joining agitator movements and protests, we need to offer them something in return to keep them quiet and complacent. A large reason why the impoverished remain in the state is due to overwhelming debt. If we agree to enact legislation that would erase a large portion of the aforementioned debt, it likely that would be they would be satisfied. Although this may upset our benefactors at Nissan, it is their belief that desperate times require unorthodox solutions, even involves operating at a loss. Decreases Japan's approval, but you know, whatever. A little bit of lag, but whatever. Where are we at with all this stuff? Because we're back with the PTRG group. Three, four months left. And not, not just operations. Dance to the dragonflies. Lambo woke to the ringing of the telephone, and anxious, a finger rolled at the cord. It dressed up and hurried out the door. Emergency. His uniform. Drew looks in the metro, and the cold eyes lay their gazes on his rank of uniform. When he got out of the carriage, he breathed a sigh of relief. Stepping out of the underground station, he felt a sea change in the air. Quiet rest of atmosphere rested over the streets as pamphlets fluttered. Rows of protesters were on their knees, hands cuffed. Police officers escorted them to the, into the patrol walk, wagons. Lamb averted his eyes and walked into the precinct. Good news here. Or good news and bad news. The quartermaster said in the briefing room, good news first. 10% late flat pay increases across the board. Silence. <clears throat> bad news. No more leave for the foreseeable future, and the inspector expects everyone to check in at least once a day. If you're not issued ride, get requested. All hands on deck, everybody. It's going to be a tough year out. Dismissed. They walked out to Time to dress up. In Sudan, Oman. We need to, We probably need to. Locker room, dress and ride equipment, Lamb cupped his face in his hands, sighing, greased palms, and gripped the ride shield and baton. A squad mate sat around in bed, just similarly anxious. The TV blasted colorful images of the ride, accompanied by the tinny voices of the reporters. They sat and waited for the calls. They waited for their turns. Of course, the crippled, wounded, and blind, and insane. The security presence on the street was gradually becoming overwhelming. The police now shared the streets with huge numbers of Hitachi security personnel in the camp by Thai men, all dedicated to sniffing out the resistance network. Higher ups, the chief executive, and his ministers were applauding the crisis, their crisis response strategy, sending their honeyed words or lies out over the radios and TVs to every household in the country. Despite all this help, Chen found himself <coughs> doing community support missions more and more often. With all the money and resources the government was pouring into saving Guangdong's wealthy corporations these days, we seem to have forgotten about the people they were ostensibly responsible for governing. Though the immediate threat of collapse had receded, businesses were still going under, and the Chinese districts were still swelling with the unemployed, the homeless, and abandoned. Some gave up and died, some crossed the border, hoping for Nanjing's mercy, though most just sat and waited. This was huge, and her mass that Chen delivered food for week after week, when he took the opportunity to invite them to a little social grouping of his own called the Committee of Chinese Labor. The government's cruelty would be their demise. Absolutely. 
Uh, I might have to fix this just to make sure they don't completely lose. Yeah, we probably will. So, but then we'll do that one. We'll do get me on the phone as well. Or maybe not. No, do we? No, no. We need to do the poison water. We'll get more growth. A single demand. More government support. More corruption, though. Well, we'll probably do the poison water. With pressures on him mounting from every direction, Chief Executive Koma has no choice but to remain steadfast and stay the course. If the system will survive, come heck or high water, the cost matters not. Even the prospect of upsetting his benefactors once or twice by denying in, denying them an opportunity to prey upon Guangdong when she's at her weakest is of no concern to him whatsoever. A reorganization of the economic department, prioritization of internal cooperation from both inside and outside of the department, and a focus on the issued hand will ensure all Guangdong can survive to see another year. Another major part of making sure that happens is granting Komai's among your patrons no further concessions. The only people Komai needs are those who know their place, and beneath his feet. This night has opened my eyes. Plunging his hands deep into the pockets of the expensive suit pants, Komai dug out a small pocket of cigarettes, rattling them before whipping out one to a light before his face. His fresh, bitter taste had died so many years ago, and now is the only thing he could stomach on the cold nights like these. After a deep inhale, he blew out the once pleasant fumes before swinging his arm back up for another puff. The dainty embers at the end of the cigarette danced and left every moment the crack crept by. His archive, as buried in the late hours of the night, was like no other place in the Pearl or South China Sea. Kamai's muscles panged with exhaustion, having to keep a watchful eye over what emerged from the belly of Guangdong's countless factories. The buzz of the single lamp that diligently kept his quarter of the room illuminated had been reduced to a simply an irritating force, nagging what remained of his daytime sanity long into the night. As Kamai's gaze drifted to each speck of dust floating in the shadows of his office, his eyes eventually locked with Hitachi corporate logo on his desk phone. His dark matte black plastic board on the case of his item glared back at him with an exceeding same set intensity he had come to grow in a habit of exhibiting. Frowning, the chief executive scrunched up his face, forcing he shut his eye tired eyes momentarily in a fatigue sh shudder. It all became so real. Chaos on the streets, flames roaring from the store window on the roadside, the crack of gunfire from encircled police, mayhem tearing Guangdong Street apart as communities bellowed and clawed at each other. The social fabric of Asian Brotherhood itself, Kamai had spiraled, would cannibalize and destroy itself in terms of this chief executive. Kamai left, reaching for the phone, already running through a list of subordinates he had to contact. He was Guangdong. If anyone knows to cut the throat singing for a revolution, it would be him. This land is mine. And we're, really, we're doing slashing wages. If you want to read this one, I've read this one before. If you want to read this one, please go ahead. But business warrant ordinance. Single demand. Yeah, I'll see this one first. The chief executive Kamai has had another card up his sleeve. This time, he wishes to force any businesses not incorporated or formed in Guangdong to pay a tax before buying any warrant or order to do business with local labor or resources. Also, make sure that no business owner enters or leaves the borders of their fair state without leaving just a tribute to the beauty that is Guangdong. The measure is controversial. Already, we hear murmurings of angry discontent among the Japanese elite and the Nissan board of directors, but it's necessary and correct, Kamai thinks. It either encourages holders of money to stay and tie themselves down in the land to the land of Guangdong as they should have, or incentivizes them to get out of the, like the traders they always were. Routine disrupted. Here this one, please go ahead. Slashing wages. I think a man. Loyalty is mandatory and compulsory, and in the state of turmoil and strife we're currently in, loyalty equates to survival. Well, not protocols enforce a model of reward and uh <clears throat> punishment. If, they, if the populace remains steadfast and obedient, they will be allocated additional resources and stimuli. If the population if the population refuses to adhere to the orders of the administration, they shall face immense hardships and receive lower amounts of rations and energy. By appealing to the natural urges of man, we have predicted this will satisfy the Japanese and Zuzian communities of the three pearls. While the majority of Chinese population will be appeased enough to prevent large scale insubordination, our brilliant chief executive once again displays his cunning and intelligence. Success is guaranteed. Those who are to come eyes vision will shall survive, both those with capital and those with knowledge, and finally those with nothing but to give it but their lives. Absolutely. Any more approval? Probably not, but whatever. On to Sudan if we can. Mm, probably not. But we'll try. Get that off your chest. Geniality. If you're wondering either one of these, please go ahead. Are we there yet? There you go. We just need to fight in very hot environments. Hey, advancements in audiovisual technology. Go. And is it hot down here? Oh, it's scorching. She's a scorcher. Underwater biting. God dang it, that sucks. 
Hear my words, you wealthy. The legislative council seemed to bow towards the podium that Koma stood up top of, sitting upright like a king before his throne. Not a mutter broke the grim silence pressing deep upon the member's chest like an impending misfortune, or the guilt preceding severe parental punishment. The face was curled and hid as the chief executive swept his gaze over the assembly, and the smirk skirmish gleefully aware of the power he held over them. Adjusting the small folds of an expensive dress shirt, he broke the deafening silence with a booming announcement. Friends, compatriots, will the council offer to its ear to the motion I propose on this fine day? Kamaz glaring teeth, yellowed by the fine meats and rare sugars, bore themselves in the smiles he pulled between the tor tortuous pauses in his speech. He spoke again, and there was not a moment to interject his proposals, not even between the tense and tormenting rest between his prepared and spitefully crafted sentences. I floor the Guangdong Business Warrant Act. As Bill demanded a warrant, and a levy attacks any firm operating within our borders without incorporation into our economic restructuring and recovery program. I'm sure you've seen your, for yourselves the excesses of those evils, those who too wolfish, to contribute to our society are capable of it. It's imperative that these mercenary activities are subdued before they can too prey on the wealth of this community. The members of the assembly looked helplessly up at the chief executive, who peered back at the whites of their eyes, containing his glee at their building distress, to a smirk at the corner of his pursed lips. No longer could capital flow through backdoor channels or in partnerships between willing collaborators. The very exchange and building of wealth was to be kept under the strict mathematical watch of the state. Not a penny would slip into the pocket without Kamai knowing something about it. What's yours is mine. If you want to be at the coffers crate, please grant it too. So we'll do that one immediately next, but... <clears throat> Coordinated response? Uh, but incepts some. The chief executive is a harsh and solitary man, but even he needs his laws, lieutenants. Beautiful. And now it's time for our esteemed chief executive to address the people of the city of Guangdong once more. He will ask them to put their faith in him once again and trust that the glorious machine that he built out of the ruins of the Yasuda crisis will outlast the oil crisis. Then he will move to outline his policy of recovery that will restore Guangdong to its rightful position of great wealth and international prestige and honor and ensure that those who deserve to hold economic control and influence are given free reign to do so. After that, it will be time for Komai uh, to get to work on his promises. He knows he must hurry. He has only so much time available to him. Is it hot enough? It is hot enough, nice. We love it hot. If it ain't hot, we don't want it. Ah, so what does this do? Decreases miscellaneous income by 0.3, decreases admin cost by 0.1, decreases Japan's approval, and gives more growth. Nice, paying your dues. Ah. Guangdong's many foreign corporations were practically omnipresent, and their presence felt in all areas of life. <coughs> their products were in every store, the factories were in every district, the advertisements were plastered on every practically every square inch of the three pearls. And all of this could not get a cheer without, without treating Guangdong with the respect she truly deserved. It was late at night. But his miles could occupy by this whole matter. The current state of affairs was quite unacceptable. Unacceptable. These companies were passed. Opportunities took advantage of Hitachi's success to hawk the goods for massive and then deserve profit. That's not last, he thought. Whether they like it or not, he'll make them, he'll make them pay for their, sh their fair share. Kumai knew what had to be done. The question was now not if, but when, or how. He knew full well that any new measures were unlikely to get much support in the Ludco than what he already had. Approaching the Ibuko was an option. The Vichy Suman was the most likely of Guangdong's leaders to be sympathetic to this cause. There were other ideas, too. Chaos and instability in China made Shanghai a deeply unattractive place to invest in. That presented an opportunity. With the right tax incentives and the fleeing capital, mostly Japanese, could easily be lured at Guangdong, of course. That would make China upset, but sure, that was a path worth considering. Finally, there was an option of using the money raised by the ordinance to subsidize new local businesses. That would eliminate any savings made, but it would improve Hitachi's image among the people. Perhaps more importantly, it would also help him stimulate the economy. Kamai ran through the options in his mind again. Learning the Japanese. Capture fleeing capital in the Republic of China, providing favorable tax rates. Ooh. Offers to send Japanese capital in China. Except as Guangdong's local businesses. Fund new large public works projects in Guangdong to make up for falling demand. Yeah, that seems like a, that seems odd if we want to do that one. Odd. Offer incentives to Japanese capital? Tax rates. Hmm. Improve the image. Stimulate the economy. Falling demand. Well, you know what? Let me try that one. Maybe? Paying your dues. It improves our image among the people, but that doesn't really matter too much, right? Hmm. I like work projects. I kind of want to see what this one does. I don't see what that one does. That seems kind of odd for us to do, and we're done here. Nice. I was hoping to try to kill them off, I guess, you know. Why not? Single to ban, a bit of leeway. Come on, Kenichiro stood at the reports from the police and the security bureau. These documents were stacked as tall as Grey Mount Fuji. And the news was all of woe, of course. Aside from the food riots and subversion for foreign agitators, obviously in the, in the pay of China, there was another issue. No matter how or open closed the borders were in the various frontier regions of Guangdong, people were leaving in droves. 
Uh, this is not something that could be dealt with with the usual measures. Come on, new. If, it, if things were allowed to proceed as they have for the past half decade or more, people would just keep fleeing. There's still will be a drain of people and therefore of capital strong enough to collapse Guangdong permanently and bring about the ruin of all Kamai had to work for. Kamai side reached for a cigarette and then grabbed a pen and started to make notes. It was time to incentivize people to stay where they were and weather the crest from that position, and convince them that one way or another that it was not just for Guangdong's sake, but to their own benefit to stay put. A bit of the leeway, yes, but that would keep them around. Suffering from success. Any man who claimed that life without war or conflict bred weak men had clearly never tried entering a market of Guangdong at peak hours. Lamb left at his bag, his arm muscles straining under the weight, he would have to walk up six flights of stairs to reach his flat. And that was a walk he was not looking forward to. Burdened by cans, vegetables, and even some meat, Glam crossed the street, although not without huffing and puffing. Now it's cross hour, something caught his eye. It was a family, mother, father, and an infant daughter. All Chinese by the looks of it. <clears throat> They're all walking from the same direction, carrying a bag that looked noticeably empty, emptier than his. Better paying a pay to shooting through him, his wages were acceptable for living well, but others did not have that luxury. <clears throat> The father looked at him, and then felt the glare of the man shot him go straight through him. Suddenly, the target fell upon his back whenever he was in uniform that had been painted right back on. It was a higher way to make him recognizable as a police officer. He eyed Lamb angrily, nudging his wife, and she shot an equally poisonous look towards him. He got purring along. The bags no longer seemed as heavy as they had before, and he had never walked up those six flights as quickly as he had done them before. Privilege makes one a target. Yeah? Oh, there you go. A little bit of lag, but whatever. Happy May, everybody. Dear Eure, if you want to read about Dear Eure, please go ahead. <clears throat> oh, the gutting knife. <laughs> to pull men forward in hard times demands a hard heart. Hard choices that only Chief Executive Kamai is willing and preparing to make. Increase hmm. the admin cost by 0.4 billion. Oh, God. Introduce a budget reorganization responsibility ordinance. Budget cuts are not easy things to enact, but when all facts were in and the numbers were crunched, sometimes they were a life-saving necessity. Come on, face with this issue with a typical forthrightness and confidence. The only question was, on which services do we enact the cuts? Public services were the first obvious cuts. Answer. By having helping the budget of certain amenities, community efforts, and public works, funds can be redirected into financial relief and police forces. Money can still flow through the country, albeit through different channels. <clears throat> now, should be some disquiet about this, but it was all for the good. Come on, sign the papers and help them dispatched. Selling victory. I'll look at that. Come on, Kirichiro was asleep in Hong Kong when he heard that the business warrant ordinance had passed. What exactly it was in the city was a trivial affair, something that he could have easily delegated. But Koshi, for all his dizzying kaleidoscope of sights and sounds, was something that wore off easily, yes. It was supposedly. An ancient city, the plane trip from Hong Kong to Koshi had been a long and dreadfully boring one, and some background and reading on his new project never heard, but it was a city much like the rest of the country that had shown its past rather than accept it. Come on, I remembered. I was seeing Koshi for the first time, squinting. I said the small, double glazed. Uh, Peoples of his jet craft. The city was organized, if you could call it that, into messy rows and lines that crisscross each other and looped around them into themselves. Like he was stumbling upon a mere fraction of some symbol carved into the face of the earth that only those above could see. Lining each row, Koshu's skyline alternated. Sometimes they looked hard enough, he could make out each flat and apartment flattened together by necessity. Flanking them, huge piles of steel and iron, frivolous monuments by the would be metropoli metropolitan elites to their own decadence. Reach out into the skies if they were digits of hand, pleading to the gods. Poverty and unimaginable wealth within whoring distance of each other. And sea melted away, replaced by another near forgotten memory. He was standing on the warm tarmac of Koshu Hakun International. That was the first uh, thing he noticed. The petrucent smell of the rain hitting the concrete seemed to be permeating every living thing in the city. A man, closely followed by a face of entourage of suits, spoke to him. Ibuka, he had such dreams, his mouth moved and his eyes glowed. With his trademark gleam, but no sound came out. There was no pity pitter patter rain, neither. No intermittent squawking of traffic, only the whipping of the cold south, uh, cold south China Sea wind. Before he woke up, the breeze grew into a frigid gale, howling. If he turned his head and listened closely, they seemed to whisper, It's not a city meant to be. Increase admin costs again, huh? Plus one of the statistic. <coughs> it had been ever since the start of the Guangdong in its current form. See, as the common workers went to work in certain large settlements someplace in the state. The pattern of travel, his associate correcting dignities, had hardly changed since the outset of Hitachi rule. Another thing that had not changed so much as it was becoming more frequent was that the people diverted themselves onto the street. Where traffic was going to and fro at breakneck speeds, it's slowing down only to wonder why all the pedestrians were wandering under the road. As a look at the reason both drivers and pedestrians sighed. There's another police corridor, and then yet inside it, another dead body. Clearly fallen from a high place and splattered on the street, those few children present asked what was going on, only to have their eyes blocked by their parents' hands, and their ears covered up so they would not know. Most people pr present wondered why the person had killed themselves. With the recent academic trouble, there were many plausible reasons that people could think of. But none of them had made the time to stand and watch. If they did not make it to work on the time themselves, it might as well be left, like them left with no choice but to jump down to the sidewalk eventually. 
So play it out time and time again. Yes, we'll do this one, and we'll do that one. Obligation, gentlemen. Amidst economic wreckage that threatens the city of Guangdong, throwing everything that makes her great into stability, it's necessary for Chief Executive Kamai to prioritize the Hitachi Corporation's survival, blah, 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 After all, if Hitachi falls flat, then just what will Kamai Kinichiro have left? The situation will make even the Morita Keo of the 50s look like a rich man by comparison. Any and all measures must be taken. Any and all benefactors and acquaintances must be called in with due haste. To that end, Kamai will reach out to various officials he knows in Manchuria and Japan, also strive to maintain his traditionally good relations with Mangyo, hiding his disdain from their earshot, of course. If Hitachi rules even among the ashes, then we are satisfied. Yeah, we're doing both these corruption things. Oh, did that me plebi? Actually, instead of doing this one first, I think we'll do this one. <coughs> because the uh, broad cycle's coming up. With the neon blue buzz of the television flicking to the government broadcast, the Chen family gathered around the small metal box in their apartment to bear witness to another re revelation from the government. The state insignia and its stylistic dark crimson shade burned into their eyes as they stared in the pearl white background and contrasted to. At a momentary chime following the announcement of the chief executive's address, a silhouette of Kamai took shape in a full view of the man sitting at his desk, speaking to the nation directly. People and communities of Guangdong, I speak to you on this pleasant evening to address our concerns as a nation. My administration is working day and night to keep our industrial civilization prosperous, but as you are aware, there has been some trouble of late. Economic unrest to varying degrees across the country has upset the harmony we share between ourselves as citizens. A television screen, cheap and just about able to picture the transmission, ran through a series of colorful graphs. No doubt designed to complicate and confuse the average observer. The image of control, however, and Kamai's understanding of the situation was gri gripping. Despite economic downfall, spiraling with each word, the chief executive muttered. Exit citizens, our hard work and management of our predicament comes down to a single factor, you trust and cooperation. Our hopes of, of uh, weathering this downturn depends on the public's faith in our administration. The father of the Chen family, pulling himself up from the crown he sat on, reached over and punched the power button before more of Kumai's affirmations could even poison his family. With all lies him always. He had an encyclopedia of words to say about a chief executive, but not the energy to voice a single one. The family sat still, huddled around the screen, dazed and tired. All that it could be said or heard was the long, longing whistle of the knife. Feeling of tired of feeling tired. And out with a knife. Scratch my back, huh? <coughs> Surgical efficiency. It is a considered option, uh, uh, opinion of Chief Executive Kamai that while his actually is efficient, it can do yet better than current, as it currently does. And if, if will, if he has anything to say about it, so he will now pressure Hitachi to evaluate every payroll budget allocation with the Guangdong down to the T, with a view on saving money and maximizing efficiency. True, this measure will end up uh, a lot of uh, fat cat senior bureaucrats who have probably not gone outside in years, but I'll take more than a reminder of the place in Guangdong to shut them up when they started screeching. After all, it was not them, but the Chief Executive who determines what does and does not happen in the state of Guangdong. Ah, uh, beginning of the product cycle. There we go. Hitachi has answers. Of course we do. Any all answers at all? Oop, my bad. Oopsie. Burning all that goodwill immediately. Oh well. And like like we did in the other run when we went with the Manchurian uh, guy run. Pump it. We're gonna go with Germany just because we want that profitability, my friends. We want to be profitable. Mm, yeah, I'm gonna increase profitability if we can. <coughs> Evident broke. Increase profitability. Amidst current economic crisis, demand for goods produced in Guangdong has collapsed. Nobody has the money required to buy any of them. Self-evident, anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear, and it cannot be ignored. Accordingly, Hitachi will now cut down its output to match current demand, be more in step with the current disposable income levels of the average consumer. By saving the money that would go to production and following to places where it would be of more use, we'll be able to make long-lasting investments in the improvement of Guangdong. Nice, there you go. Nah, fighting the Americans is going to be a pain in the butt. The American divisions are actually very strong. Unfortunately, very strong. Nice. Oh my, nice. we're just having a good time here. We're just here to beat everybody up. There they go. And I'll be just really collapse it. Uh, pay attention. The clock had just struck five in the afternoon. As the hands made the final tick, the chief executive cleared his throat and shuffled the papers on the desk, taping them to the wooden face so it didn't nearly organize them. Now we're going to go first. Screw it. Uh, <clears throat> his organization did not uh, fool the, the man. His groom has bared down on them from across the conference room, almost physically belting them with disappointment and animosity. After a deep sigh, Kamal's greedy, tired voice broke the silence. Near moments in the intro, his introduction, it was more than clear that the chief executive was fed up and tired of what he deemed to be excuses. Spiraling economic crisis, age-old man beyond what his arrogance could bear. Once Grim Sons had fulfilled the conference room again, 
Tachi bureaucrats and bureau representatives tremble to speak, beginning each sentence with a quivering mutter. They ran through documents, reports, spreadsheets of banal platitudes muffled in a great, great nothing for Komaki and Ichiro. Interrupted, they're mumbling with a fear, mumbling with a roar, hammering his palm onto the surface of the glossy wooden table. How many times do I have to tell you, morons? I don't care for your excuses or your reason why your head shouldn't be on the block. It gets you after a deafening pause. It's me who gets the blame for your stupid mistakes. At me. After everything I've done, you always find a way to screw it up. The chief executive pinches his nose, bracing to calm himself down, lest his rage embarrass himself any further. The bureaucrats, eyes wide and panic, glare back at him with a childlike fear. Kamai dismisses him with a wave of his hand, not even looking at them, to which they scatter their scrounging up their sheets. Kamai was aware how exactly what the six were, woefully so. Properly this time. For the love of God, properly. I want to do this one first just to get the, the thing on first. Yeah. Ooh. Squeeze dry. Crunch and condense. More income. I like that too. Ooh, that's good too though. A lot of these are very good, you know. Uh, we just need the one with 5% more here. We're done with that one. And up here, we're, we need 17 and a half. And we have 17 and a half. Beautiful. Wondrous. You can help beat up the Americans' divisions, that's all I care about. Khartoum. Here to keep the profits as long as possible. Machel overthrows the regime. Sharp and quill. Scratch, 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 scratch. Please, Commissioner Tsushida Kuni Yasu completed his, contemplated his boss. Chief Executive Komai, marking off a sheet with a precise several strokes. So, departmental recipients. recipients. A governmental funding. We're having the funding cross out so that it all be transferred over to the police. Nothing was being spared, no matter who it was connected to or how beneficial it was during more peaceful times. Scratch, 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 scratch. It was not a moment for a fraud and fraud. She, she knew that too well. The police chief, redoubt, the redoubtable through he himself was, still sat and sweating. And he dared cut off his appear while he was scratched off name so methodically. That's the own name be scratched off, but he knew that feared that mass uproar would cause everywhere when, but the police. Scratch, 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 scratch. Komai continued, but momentarily peered up at his hatchet man. And to the policeman's horror, the angle at which Komai stared at him exposed the deep wides of his eyes. Wide of his eyes. More frightening to Chushita was what Komai said, even as his scratching continued. Do you have a problem, Commissioner? Do you have a problem? Yes, you. Huh. Let's take a look, see? Decrease social costs, and decrease admin costs, increase military costs, increase liquid reserves, more political power. Very good. But I am broke. Um, I've read this one before, so if you read this one, please go to head. Yeah. So we want to hit this one next, definitely. Renew drive, so. I'm just gonna just slowly going up north. That's all I'm doing. Yep, we're at 100%. Hey, I've asked me some power efficiency technology. Very nice. Iron Velvet. Uh, rising from his desk, Kamai took a moment to appreciate the view of Koshu as he mentally reviewed the newest budget proposal from his men. It was a rough draft, but the core of it was exactly what it was asked for. The remaining money being funneled into populist drivel, piecemeal was pulled and subsidies propped up, blow to failure slashed. We were directed the recent expansion of the security forces. Once it was pushed through the let go of true peace, an order could be finally begin to reign in the streets. But till then, it could deal with other corporations. You could practically feel the displeasure radiating from the office buildings with the idea of having the subsidies cut, but the new Guangdong would not reward failure. To start with. Though the rabble and the Glucko would have to be swayed to bring it into the law, for now at least. Not for these two. <coughs> Knew that he needed more boats than he had to start with. Kumai did the tally in his head, and the conclusions were unsurprising. Matsushita's spine remained flexible as always, so a quick show of force and a call ought to bring him to the line, even as he stood to lose more than usual. On the other hand, it was the carrot might be better than the stick when Kumai's grip was still constant, contested. Bushitsu's visionary leader could well be brought on. Many of the elements of the budget were things he had championed before after all. Then again, either would demand resources or cloth that could be put to better use elsewhere, so the option simply ran it through, ran it through with his current support was tempting indeed. Ultimately, Kamai would have to make a decision and settled on... Nothing. Obstinance. Um, if you want to put this, please go ahead. We could use more. Yes. Good. Snaking our way around here. If it ain't broke, if she ain't broke. Um, yeah, there's that one. Which I do want to do next, but we can wait probably. I mean, that'd be good to do, but whatever. 
crunch and condense. In the interest of maximizing profits for industrial conglomerates, Guangdong, companies no, un, under government oversight will be squeezed to the highest total output possible. This invokes cutting corners, lengthening shifts, and skipping on benefits for long-time employees. Kamai is not completely sold on the approach, but in the interest of the increasing Guangdong's prosperity, he'll let it happen for now. Yeah, we need to do this one too. Decrease the growth. Whatever is within our soul or control to pass by the poppets, we will use, even if it costs significant discomfort in everyday life. Crush and destroy. King is in the county room. It'd have been a good day for Kamai, I thought. Uh, the budget reorganization ordinance would have, of course, passed through the legislative council without a hitch. Stashes influence stretched across the council like an octopus, his tentacles pulling the straight tycoons and business owners into Kamai's machine. <coughs> he floated through the reports of how the cuts had gone, as expected. The public utilities and welfare had taken the biggest cut. The money would be better spent on the security, anyways. Uh, Stash could step in and cover the holes in the utilities. There had been little to no opposition to this, save for the usual whining coming from Morita and his Zuzian friends. Kamai supposed that this was the one thing, one thing most of the council could agree on, outside from the love of money, a secure love of security. As he continued to dispassionately flip through the papers, Kamai noticed there had been a more resistance on the reduction of business and research subsidies provided by the state. He grimaced, sipping his tea, cup of tea. He need to explain that to investors tomorrow. It wouldn't be popular, but he could explain it anyway. Or away. Perhaps he would simply have to further buff up the security detail. Perhaps the court and tighter so that they knew how to precisely dire the money that would be in the crisis. An oil crisis. Placing him down, Kamai laid back and uh, sat contently. It was well and truly in control. Not Matsushita, nor Buka, nor Morita, nor Nissan, nor any other relevant tycoon who sought to be at the top. It was just him. Sweet victory! Nice. Also, if you really wonder about a new drive, like I said, please go ahead. No stopping and touching now. As well as squeeze drive. We'll do this one too. And we're doing this one currently, but then we'll do, like, we shut up and get on with it. The crude ingrates and bleeding hearts, dissident groups, public dissenters, you name it, you will not stop bothering us with their incessant babble about reforming humanity. This cannot be born. Accordingly, Chief Executive Kamai has reached a decision. We'll pass out a civil obedience law which will sever domestic communications such as phone lines and enforce harsh curfews that are unpopular to be darned. The chief executive feels more comfortable implementing this measure as opposed to the public order and police law. This will not set off the ungrateful civilians as much as the law could have. Nice. So that'll be good. And also, if you want to read about this one, the skin of our teeth, please go ahead head to the last construction. Get on with it, Kamaya thought, as we got to the work preparing his address to the let go, and so he did. The chief executive took his place behind the lectern, fixed everyone with a glimmered eye, and spoke. His words were intense. There was a grim calm to his expression, and he only frequently, infrequently looked down to the paper in front of him. For a speech that purported to lay down the law, one Fujitsu lawmaker remember, there were a lot of platitudes, increased measures of security, surveillance, and promotion of the acts tending towards the preservation of public order all necessary for stability to return to the streets of the state of Guangdong. Those words were not just platitudes. One of the few Sony men left in the chamber thought. They were not specific enough to justify that about anything, from merely stopping legislators and searching them as they entered the chamber to Hitlerite methods of arresting and possibly executing nine degrees of an alleged lawbreaker's familiar kindred. Matsushita Masaharu looked on, not daring to say what he was thinking. And that, with his seemingly vague talk, Gamai was scheming to cut off the final civil liberties yet preserved in Guangdong for all that disgusted him, and prevented his mouth from opening and betraying his adopted father's trust by putting an end to the Matsushita Corporation's ever fainter hope of survival in the Pearl Delta. To help him, help him in that duty, Matsushita kept repeating a passage he had read years ago, I think, but dare not speak. And we'll, then we'll do this one too, but we gotta wait for the uh, let go to pass our stuff. Thereafter, Chief Executive Kamai will prove yet another reevaluation of welfare spending. All kinds of complex loopholes of exploiting commissions will evaluate the success of what little remains of the former Guangdong Social Security program. But Kamai knows what conclusion they will reach since he pre-selected their recommendations to ensure that welfare is given only to those who deserve it. Back with these fixed reports, Kamai will change the requirements for welfare receipt eligibility so that the Chinese are more or less totally excluded, thus ensuring that far less has to be pumped into that nuisance of a budget item. The Chinese, after all, do not need the same level of care of his Japanese regime. Being for or foreordained to live as laborers and servants, they should receive only the level of care that we ordinarily provide such people. There are always ways to cut corners within our own authority. After all, what do the Chinese really deserve anyway? Nice. Keeping up appearances. Uh, I think I heard this one before, so... Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it's one before. Friend M and I. Kamai's hand over the receiver's desk phone with anticipation to compose his upcoming mes messages in his head. He was preparing to call Matsushita and Ibuka for a fateful meeting to persuade them to cast their support for the civil obedience ordinance. So normally he would not bother with such formalities, but in this case a more refined attempt at coercion was necessary. Superior's Manchuku will no doubt balk at his curious decision to temporarily accommodate the corrupt and decadent political system of Guangdong during its repression of uh, seditious elements, but their concerns did not matter to Kamai. Guangdong was his kingdom, and he would not concern himself with the petulance. Of those a thousand kilometers away, could they truly understand what he was building? He doubted it. 
Of course, none of his ambitions matter. The ordinance did not pass, and time was of the essence. No more da da dallying. He picked up the receiver and dialed the number. To Matsushita's office, his plan uh, to expend the necessity of the effort fully drafted. But he put it down because it wasn't necessary. Absolutely. We're doing okay so far. Iron fist unshackled. Well, Komai went over to the meeting with Matsushita Mibuka with growing satisfaction. The two had folded with little resistance, and there was nothing more in his ordinance's way. He now had the freedom to shape Guangdong's security policy to an unprecedented extent, and already had his mind was, was watched with the possibilities that lay ahead of him. With the backing of a decisive majority let go, Komai could do away with the miserable Saxon allowance of habeas corpus, adding an amendment under the civil obedience ordinance to permit raids and arrests without warrants. A mere government flat or fiat would be enough this way. This way, the city of Guangdong could pursue threats to public order and internal stability without the burdensome restraint of formal procedures. A doubt resurfaced in his mind. He may have won sufficient political backing for this act, but would the populace of Guangdong accept it? He did not care for their approval, but even he feared the possibility of a public backlash spiraling out of control. Not all problems could be solved with over first and force, and perhaps a more moderate solution was necessary. Additional funding for security forces would shore up the gaps in the system without the stain of a creeping authoritarianism. Then again, there was always the option to do nothing to save his political capital for other battles. Sure, the campfire time, police aren't limited by necess necessity by having warrants to conduct raids. Increase funding. Hmm. Goodbye, habeas corpus. <coughs> March of the Wolf Brigade. Uh, and clearance any day of the courtyard in front of the Guangdong Legco Le Le complex was host of a rare sight. Crowds of protests are chanting angry slogans before a line of armor riot police with shields extended. Security forces have been taken unaware by the spontaneous outcry of the people, but their response to the situation would be swift and decisive. Behind their masks and red tinted visors, the police stared down the protesters with cold contempt. When the time came, they would make no excuses. First came the high pressure blast from the water cannons and harshly barked orders from the loudspeakers, ordering the protesters to return to their homes. But for once, the state's firm hand did not face the crowds, and now the police were left with no other choice. It was a blue, and the police began to slow and steady march while they. Well, that could not be halted. The other shows firmly came down on the protesters with riot batons, beating the crowd back with iron resolve and no mercy. However, this was only a prelude to a more terrible act. For the unlucky individuals beaten down by the police were soon snatched away by waiting a security force behind them to take, be taken into the unmarked black vans and never to be seen again. One way or another, the voice of the people would be silenced. We have the money. Um, I think I read this one before. Yeah. If you read this one, please go ahead. Due to a comfortable majority, voting majority, we do not need to engage in simple bribery. So, pretty normal. Happy October, everybody. You may just trying to get through these pre-riots so we can get to the riots. Becoming infantry leader, huh? Nice, are you in the trickster a little bit? Yeah, it was a rumor mill. Oh, Yoshiko couldn't help but overhear the woman. She was standing only a few feet away from the high-end clothing store Yoshiko had been browsing. She was half a whispering to someone else in Japanese that apparently even phone calls back home were being taped now, and that face-to-face -face vow was only safe way. Face-to-face -face was the only way safe way to speak. No sooner than she had finished giving the warning to whoever she was talking to, the woman could be heard exiting the store in a hurry. Yoshiko herself had been careful ever since Hitachi took over. She knew there simply wasn't a place for politics at her workplace anymore. Unfortunately, that meant covering whatever inane topics remained. Gossip, tea, fashion. It was all bleeding together in her head. It wasn't entirely surprised by the rumor, but she wanted to test it for herself. At a hotel public phone, she gave Takasaki a call. At the line connected, Yoshiko heard it. Click. The rumors were true, and Yoshiko could barely register Takasaki's greetings over the phone. There's nothing to say in this kind of environment. At last, at least, not over the phone. I'll be back in the office in 30 minutes to talk to you then. Nice. We, we only get 5% stability, which sucks, but whatever. But yeah, there you go. And through the gauntlet. And rework resource allocation. Another situation that's been dealt with as quickly as possible is a matter of resource allocation. Let's take a metaphor metaphorical knife uh, and cut up the complex system of supply and demand like so many pieces of sas sashimi at the dinner table. Resources will now be allocated in such a manner as it will streamline production and electricity distribution throughout the city of Guangdong. Ideal this measure, proposed by the chief executive, will save Guangdong enough resources to avoid strain when the full economic recovery inevitably comes around. Glowing embers. Uh, we want to get down here as fast as possible. <laughs> the latest budget package, represented by the finance ministry, appeared like a golden dish in Komai Kinoshiro's desk. All steaming from the hot kitchens of the civil bureaucracy where all kinds of torturous and economists or econ economistic decisions emerge from. As Cyril Claus has stripped the paper, brutally n numerical in appearance, Chief Executive stated the clauses from behind the lenses of his room glasses before gritting up a grunt of approval. With a flick of a pen and a wave of in the hand, the package left his office never to be seen again. Such short memory of the bill is not shared by those outside the ivory towers of Goshu, however. 
and the concrete streets of those desolate cityscapes, where passerbys dragged their feet to work as they choked on yet on the smoke, smog smothering them. Social spending had been blood dry for years, as families could barely scrape by, but the roots and packages could totally get what was left of the government support. Too many Kumai's administration had dumped the body of a responsible government by the roadside of history, chasing profits and leaving the scraps of the surface below. They knew they were being worked to the bone, but now there's nothing left to lose. When Kukuki grew into a movement of solidarity, placards began to emerge from the damp back streets of Guangdong cities on the roadside, where not even the government ministers could turn a blind eye to such suffering. In red paint, often splattered on cardboard sheets and unfolded boxes, read the words tyrant, murder, occupier, and other defaming accusations. Around street corners, back alleys, and street bars, secret bars, where law enforcement could not beat people senselessly, people gathered to speak of their discontent. The weekend darn would only hunch over for so long. A fire rises across the Pearl River Delta, for once people knew something before the chief executive did. Kumai's great brow of two face its grim consequences. Chief Executive, be reasonable, but now, uh, we're going to get through this one, and then I'm going to do these ones off screen, A Breath of New Life, as well as the new Lucens, and then we'll get to the next point where we can really do uh, different focuses concerning, um, you know, the, this path, the personalist path for Komaya Kinichiro, tidying up the state. And then it warmed a lot of the room, Komaya sat down and filed on his desk, it was, then it was Bill, open the open on the page detailing rationalizations of family payment schemes such a common source of fraud among the lower class. Oh, come on, I thought. There were no notes or pages or anything for he left it in the earlier drafts. Only signature on the front would suffice. The social spending reconciliation ordinance was necessary for the continued fiscal health of, finance, of Guangdong. With his passing, the fat and gristle which slowed down the state would be carved away. The state would run cleaner and leaner. Expenditure transmuted into revenue. Kumai sat back in his chair with a satisfied smile. And instead, he tallied up his supporters. He had his own man, but why sweeping changes like these worked out much better than they had external support. Meeting and sidekick were obvious opponents. They fought with them on every other bill to date. Why would this one be an exception? Masashita's lot might have one or two with Kitsi reason, and he could certainly rely on certain Fujitsu men to recognize the necessity of the SSRO, but it was rival tycoons who held other votes, and right now they were a firm no. It bo uh, oh, Kumai got up, poured himself out water from his office pitcher. He knew the book agreed with the bill in principle, but the professional relationship was strained, unless Kumai delivered a short, ra sharp rap on the nose. He booked most of his votes could would be against him. Matsushita was less open in his position. That little worm, Kumai brought up more water to his cracked lips. He couldn't even bother to challenge me openly. Then he thought, Matsushita. He didn't have to be strong-armed. Tax relief amendment, somewhere in the final draft, might be enough to secure Matsushita's support, but was he willing to sacrifice a bit of that new revenue to guarantee success? Wouldn't twisting his arm be much easier? Eh, that's my response. Eh. Let's see what we can do there. That might be it to end this war down here. Maybe? No? Yes? Ah, there you go. Yay! Guess Japan's pretty well too. Nice. Not, not as good, but help us. A flicker and then total darkness in her apartment. A one cog alarm has not even put the pot of water she's going to boil on the stove. Now, the two lights in her apartment have gone out. She drops a blind from the window, sole window in her room, and sees that the entire quarter, not just her apartment, is blacked out. She wonders if this is a new normal power outage. Rare these days, her special one increasingly becoming less so. Already, she can hear loud voices swearing out of the frustration of the power outage. Then her baby joins. <clears throat> Children from a sleep prophetic commotion. She begins to whimper, and begins to, she begins to wail. She shifts, ready to move to tend to her, but then she sees a scene around the cross street. Lam Lockham, Kalam. House of Scrum, but these days her eyes are just faster than the darkness. The bright moonlight lights the street well enough, and enough, well enough for her to make out exactly what's going on. Nothing. Good. Police line the streets, their helmets shining in what little light the moon reflects back to earth. And then she sees struck, so unloading yet more police. She shakes her head, sighing heavily. A friend of hers, UK, was lost to one of those blackout raids. Lakam could not help him. How could she help her neighbors? All she could do is witness yet more atrocity. She walks to the baby's part of the room. They'll be awake for the rest of the night. The eleventh hour. We're over time, Chun's fellow CCL volunteer whispered to him as they crept along the sidewalk, trying to stay out of the way of the streetlight. I know which one was for back. It shouldn't take so much longer. It shouldn't take much longer. With well, a huge increase in the homeless population over the last couple months, the CCL supply runs are now gradually taking up more and more time. Right now, Chun, well, and his companion were out past curfew, meaning they could be arrested without with Pi passing any attached to patrol. The huge bags of food they were carrying would immediately mark them out as resistance members. They'd not be treated kindly. They turned a corner, and Chun was momentarily blinded by the flash of a spotlight. As soon as he heard the shots coming from down the road, he dropped everything and ran, rubbing his at his eyes. He ran into a lamppost and bounced off, stumbling before ducking into an alleyway. It was only then he noticed that his companion wasn't with him. A faint series of moans and thumping noises somewhere off to his left was punctured with a single gunshot, and then there was silence. John's hands began to shake. He just gotten some of the best luck of his life, both in that he wasn't caught and that the Hitachi thugs had killed his colleague instead of torturing him for information about the cell. He may not ask the cell leader for more weapons. They couldn't be on the receiving end of many more encounters like this. Violence begets violence. And of course we're talking to a brick wall. And uh, what's good for Japan? Well, 97%. I kind of want to do that one. 
We can lower ourselves by a little bit, maybe. But the power doesn't mean anything. There you go, there you go, there you go. All in pursuit of money, right? Now, let's at least pass this thing. Decrease costs. I love decreasing costs. Zujin and Chinese descent will be more numerous against us, huh? Well, that sucks. I love profits. Two days left. But we gotta save first and get to November. Oh, come on. Never change. Oh, Lee Hay spoke first, breaking the, the silence of the dinner table. Hey, look at this. They're slashing the welfare budget. Do you know what this means? There's nothing left for us. So, just as normal then, Chen replied. This is the only thing those dudes know how to do, and her weakest point. They take what little we have away from us. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of this utterly failed government. They continue with their sparse meals in uneasy silence, like everyone else did. They return to their jobs the morning after, to the regular rhythm of backbreaking menial work. They'd have to work harder for less pay, but what could they do? They still needed to eat, and the rent still needed to be paid. But something had changed, re really. It changed a long time ago. All across Guangdong, including Chen and Hei, were no longer to on keen on putting up, uh, putting, putting up with the strings, or things. We cannot rely on anyone, Chun's voice was strident, forceful and hay struck by the power of the behind those words. Not Itachi, not Morita, no, not Lee, not anyone or anything. Useless, all of them. After a while, Hay spoke again. You're going to the CCL meeting later? Yes, Chun was slightly surprised, though he tried not to show up. Are you going to tell me it's too dangerous? You know that won't stop me. No, I'm not, Hay's eyes focused. I just want to let you know that Y and I are completely behind you. Let us know what you need. We'll figure out how we can help. We'll not be selling anymore, Chun. Very nice. Not as I do. Our chief executive in Guangdong is, is our strongman. His authority over the Delta is not to be questioned by anyone, let alone by commoners who rightfully ordain place in life as to do and die rather than question why. While the chief executive emphasizes the fact we're taking a present, strongman approach, a different reality will play out on the streets of Guangdong. State repression will be the primary method of dealing with the rabble. Kumai can achieve his plan is to silence them as much as possible as soon as possible. Using brutal methods to put down the protesters once and for all. Case crashes. Oh, this was a mistake. Ah, oh, that sucks. Um, we'll go back and do that one a little bit later. Uh, on and on it spins. Um, I think I've read this one before, probably so. Hey, one of these one, please go ahead. Crack at the facade. The drop. Oh, increase Japanese frustration by quite a bit, huh? From the rooftops. So. Loose lips. Stash report, fight goes on. For bad or worse. Consequences. It's been a disaster. Can I be further investigated? Oh well. I'll deal with that later. Oh wait, rider strength is really high now. Oh god. That's not good. So, we're just here to do the focuses for the most part. Let's get this done now. Yep. Yep. Pretty good so far. Thin pickings. Well, crap. That's not good. In the meantime, not as I do. Star Wars Society. <clears throat> The virtuous and steadfast people Guangdong, I speak to you with passion and gratitude in my heart. Ooh. I think I read this one before, too. Well. Yeah, this one is all worth society. this one, please go ahead. Turbulent, turbulence and tumult. Wipe the streets. Now is an opportune time to show these subversive traitors, these agents of the Open and Einheit's Pact, the rightful place beneath us in submission to us alone and not for any foreign interests, religion, or ideology. Few methods of better obtaining this goal than liberally applying force. Few mechanisms of doing or so are more effective than a cavalry charge, so let's put the horses available to our great police officers to effective use. On orders of a great chief executive and the commissioner of police, officers will now charge clumps of protesters with batons at the ready. We'll enable them, this will enable them to make as many arrests as are necessary in order to break these upstarts' wells and put an end to their not inane movements. Better eat over this, but you got it too. Underwater blaze, whatever. Dismantle. We failed. We'll try again. Let's that one. I don't want to increase Japanese despair anymore, so. Let's get the committee. There you go. Security status tenuous. Corruption. Decrease strength by 6%. That's good to do. Man after midnight. <clears throat> it was approximately 4.22 late in the night. The chief executive had spent the last four hours behind his mahogany desk. Or split. Or plight. Or bleat. With reams of dossiers, eyewitness reports, warrants, and a plethora of unfinished paperwork. The incandescence of a single lamp situated on the desk of the most powerful man in Guangdong provided the sole line of defense against the darkness of the night. <clears throat> a lively grin that Kamai once sported had all but withered away. Now supplanted by Saul and Mian on a dour face. <clears throat> he closed his eyes. 
A million thoughts racing through his weary brain. He took a deep breath, banishing the intrusive thoughts from the crevices of his skull. He now stood from his, up from his seat, sauntered towards an open window. He peered down the fading neon lights at Koshu, and though the sight betrayed him, he found the view oddly quite tranquilizing. His lips began moving as he addressed a non-existent audience. I wonder how long it take for the order to return to the streets, his voice was hoarse. Gods and Emperor know that the measures I have taken were less than scrupulous, though I know better than most that a naive man cannot tame his buddy, this buddy nation. He closed his eyes as finished statement, a sigh escaping his lips. He adjusted his sight at the reams of paperwork waiting him. As he drew closer, a general sound began playing in his head. He could feel the him reverberating throughout every inch of his body. He gazed at a telephone situated on his desk, its surface embellished with a Hitachi logo. He sat on his cushioned chair and reached for the phone handle. As his hand hovered over the dial pad, he could feel a burgeoning pain growing from within his skull. He knew that the cause behind his sudden affliction. He knew the future implications that would come as a result of the action he was about to take. He once again banished a thought and began dialing, a naive man cannot tame this nation. Safety off. The writing ingrates outside didn't understand that the corporations of Guangdong are above them for the benefit as well as ours, of course. At this rate, it's doubtful that they'll ever come to understand. Perhaps we have no choice but to kill a few of them all, all right, to frighten them into submission. On orders of our most wise and merciful chief executive and the commissioner of the police, officers will now be authorized to use lethal force to the extent they deem necessary when they're forced to deal with the traitors in the streets. No cause of protesters' lives is too high, but helps restore the established order and the beauty of the state of Guangdong. Absolutely. There we go. Probes over in the overlooked. This one. No. New plans. Um, come on, Ken and Cheryl continued to look over the various reports of rioting and violence when he heard a knock on his office door. After allowing them in, he found that one of his aides was there to inform him that the director, Samijama's, Samijama's delegation would be arriving in a few short days. Apparently, the delegation was demanding an immediate meeting with Kamai himself. Hardly surprised he given his last phone call to Samijama. No, if you don't know about this one, please go ahead. That's good news, however. According to the aide, only one airplane carrying a small handful of Mongo's executives would be arriving in Guangdong, and this meant that their decision to take direct action still hadn't been made, and the Kumai still had time to rectify the situation at hand. If we wanted to keep Mongo and the rest of the king from deciding that further action was necessary, they needed to make sure that this visit went perfectly. Considerable money would go towards the safety and well being of the delegation. Additionally, the delegation must be kept from witnessing the rioting firsthand. The luxury hotel rooms far removed from the chaos would keep them both safe and from seeing something that might sway them to make a rash decision. Yes, there was still a way to salvage this situation. An unfriendly or lack of faith. The recent bombing of the Imperial Trade Bureau in Hong Kong was an unfortunate consequence of the investigation's sluggish pace. Oh. Oh, we can read this again. before earlier. So. Continue the mission, why not? The delegation arrives. A small aircraft carrying director Samujami. Samujami. Jima, and two of the Hmong Yo executives landed safely at an airfield outside of Koshu. They are waiting for them at the airstrip. We're all pleasant trees of a state visit. A, a band, a loudly celebrating the arrival of the music, the staff, the chief executive, and of course the chief executive Komaki Nishiro himself. As Sami Jima disembarked on the plane, he had more remarked while, while he was happy to meet, finally meet with Komai, he was irritated that they could not land Koshu itself to survey the damages due to a last minute diversion. Something he found odd considering how well prepared the airfield was to receive them. In these trying times, there's nothing more certain than uncertainty, Komai said with a well-practiced, disingenuous smile. There's no need to worry, however. I will make sure that you and the other executives are well taken care of. I've arranged for you to stay in one of the finest hotels in the world, right outside of Koshu. All you need is step into the helicopter and we'll take, you, take care of the rest. Mollified, Samijima and the rest of the delegation boarded the various helicopters that were bound for the hotel. As they climbed in, Samijima remarked out how odd it was riding a helicopter without windows. This is sewage them all the worries. Pattern shaping. Even though this place could head. Fault goods. Not looking great there, but whatever. Framing. Every day, the visiting delegation among your executives had at their need every need to cater to. They ate the finest food, slept on the finest sheets, and experienced absolute luxury and all from the safety of their hotel. Each day, the executives would gather in the hotel's conference room to meet with Kumai on the various challenges of the riots presented in Guangdong. First, topic was security. Kumai admitted the issue had yet to be resolved, yet he pointed out that their stay in Guangdong had been without threat so thus far. The charge of security forces, with the assistance from the Kenpai Tai, assured the safety of the executives. Kumai's calm and friendly demeanor was temporarily lost when one executive asked if they could leave the hotel. Of course, they could not leave the hotel. Another meeting was convened about Guangdong's economy. Yes, these riots have been led to undesirable economic outcomes, Komai admitted. However, thanks to the prudence and wisdom of Hitachi, they are in an excellent position to recover from the riots once they ended. Komai even added that the riots may serve to put Hitachi even further ahead of its competition in Guangdong by weakening the competition a blessing in disguise. Each day, the executive sat through Komai's presentations, growing more and more restless, yet it remained clear that nobody was permitted to leave the hotel grounds at any point. After all, why would you even want to? Everything's fine. Dang the buck. 
Determine the location. There you go. Why not? A vicious strike. Though he was relatively far away, Lung uh, couldn't help but look at the crowd with pride. It was a mass of people marching in a real fire with their eyes, a mix of anger and hope that that drove them to keep going, even now. And the shadow come out in a chair resign in unison, and they did so many, 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 many times. <clears throat> the sound was so loud that the very ground beneath their feet seemed to shake. Perhaps he thought we could actually change things here. Well, but now they had much more ordinary concerns. The end of the street was blocked up by riot vans <clears throat> with many Mangyo logos on it. Those vehicles served as a reminder of the Dutch's presence here, and even though their men were mostly absent. Lung could see a young man with a megaphone standing at the top of one of the vans. Uh, he couldn't have been older than 18, but there he was, waving an enormous CCL flag, taunting the government, laughing with a silly grin on his face. A sharp crack shot through the air. Its echo boomed across the street. Puzzled, Lung looked at the sky, which was still bright. It didn't look like it was going to rain. Before he could figure out the reason, however, more rot shots rang out. The young man was now caught underwear, landing with a hard thud on the asphalt below. Lung's feet reacted before his mind, and immediately he set off, thinking of nothing except how to get out of here as soon as possible. Then the whole street was a horde of panicked people. The screaming was intermittently punctuated by the loud popping, continuing for minutes until the sound was left, left uh, sound left was silence, and only people who were left uniformed or dead. Inevitably, some were gone. Uh, many others were injured in the crush too. Lung reflected on the incident later, wondering what they'd done to deserve this much retribution. Well, you did what you did, <coughs> or lack thereof. New friends, old, biz old, old friends, new businesses. In these latter days, since the fall of Yusuke and Suzuki. We've been more than loyal to the glorious, beautiful city. Who has been more loyal to the glorious, beautiful city of Guangdong and to prosperity and then the corporations with Nissan, Mangyo, and Hitachi at their head? Who has contributed more to this great nation than them? Who else is better than a uh, place to come to our aid than Nissan in particular? Chief Executive Komai, relying on his various contacts and connections with the Nissan Co Corporation, has issued a directive calling in Nissan and security forces to back up the police and security troops as well as manage the rioters. Uh, they'll be kept as a mere full soldiers in the organizational hierarchy, but yes, there must be what well, we need to pull through. Chaotic? Alright, whatever. A vicious strike. Red water. There we go with that too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oops, that's corruption. My bad. Banger Whimper. There you go. Receive one of the required clues needed before we get strike CCL. Boiling over. <coughs> it's been excruciating four days of boring and increasingly misrepresentative representations for the Mangyo executives. We'll come to Guangdong and see how Komai was handling the riots. They finally reached the final day when Komai was finishing his last presentation. But everything would end up fine and Mangyo's bottom line would come out with minimal damage. Unfortunately for Komai, Director Samijima had enough of the charade, and Komai had enough of this. You and your men have been clearly hiding a lot from us. Why are we not allowed to go outside of this situation for ourselves? What are these explosions we keep hearing? We obviously have been working to prevent Mang Yo from acquiring an accurate assessment of the situation, which leads me to believe that it is much worse than what your presentations have shown. I demand this be rectified immediately. Komai adjusted his posture slightly in his chair to look at Samijima. Directly in the eyes, he responded coldly, Director, we've taken every possible precaution to ensure your safety during these dangerous times. Luckily, Guangdong is working closely with the IJA and Kempata agents to remedy the situation as expediently and efficiently as possible. I hope you understand how much effort was put into your visit to ensure everything went smoothly and safely. Samijima got up to Nahaf, collecting his things and hastily making for the exit. It's not over, Kamai. If things don't improve soon, you'll have heck to pay. Excuse me, Kumai snapped. What did you do to help Guangdong during the oil crisis? Nothing. I kept it profitable then. I'll keep it from safe, keep it safe now. You want to know the, what the Manchukuo should expect from Guangdong? Profits. Lots and lots of profits. A tense meeting. There you go. Jaffe's concerns are growing. Taking it to the streets. Don't you forget about me. And we should have it soon. <coughs> Certainly not them big fish. Let's proceed. But all its toils, all friends' businesses. Let's see. Um, if you want to read about will survive, please go ahead. Time running out. Uh, go ahead as well. Cool. Nice. 
bones on concrete. Any say that wishes to survive for more than two or three hours must prior as well for those who contribute the most to it, rewarding only the good and loyal servants. Such a state must, moreover, feel no qualms while relying on brutal methodologies to punish the traitors and over ambitious parasites that, forgetting their oaths and duties, choose to betray the state's rulers and his government. Our chief executive understands his wisdom and will put it to use. <coughs> Excuse me. By directive of our magnanimous chief executive, backed by the commissioner of police, the security forces of the city of Guangdong will now be permitted to use brutal force and non-lethal dealings with the rioting traitors. Police brutality will now be considered elevated and correct in police strategy. After all, what better method is there to intimidate and subdue the rabble in the streets than breaking a few legs and arms at will? Nice. Spare is hopeless. Yay. Once I've had. Um, let's keep quiet. Oh, we'll do that one. They'll bomb and burn, but what else is new? Small town slaughterhouses, or slaughterers. Attention on deck, Lamb and his co workers sit at the position of attention. Just happy to recall from the front lines for whatever way to their station. So, the group of well dressed men piled in the room. They weren't quite at IJA, but they weren't local police either. The man wore the, with their faces, one that had been through numerous campaigns, as you were. The commanding officer of the mysterious fighters ordered to the policeman. Immediately, he dropped military bearings and did away with customs and courtesies. The man grinned. So, what are these men keeping Guangdong together? So, are these men doing it? I like what I'm seeing. It's I'm uh, Matsubara Tatushi. And our detachment is part of the Nissan Security Headquarters in Harbin. We've been in Manchuria for years, and we're on the front line of the anti-partisan war up in the Manchukuo. Your days of hiding behind riot shields are over. Instead of guarding a perimeter, you're going to be bringing the fight to them. They almost started to piece it together. But while these backwater butchers were brought in, that command was desperate. They were done treating these protesters as unruly workers that could be back, beat back into the factories. They're not partisans, and they're about to get treated as such. Lam wanted to breathe a sigh of relief. His siege was ending after all. He, however, didn't let his guard down instead of giving another look at Mat Matsubara and his men. Something has replaced a beleaguered look on their faces. It was eagerness in their eyes. It was their turn in the talent show of cruelty. No negotiations. I would say wishes to survive for more than two or three hours, and must prior as well for those who contribute the most to it. Or only the good and loyal servants. Furthermore, it must all of, must at all costs avoid negotiating or capitulating the will of the hostile actors who, rather than holding the interests of the state and its ruler to heart, and so concern themselves with their own parochial follies. In our case, it's also actors include the, the unisons and protesters who have troubled us since the fall of Yusuda and are now our rise of power, but especially now. Even after all this, these rabble rousers still have the gall to make demands. Uh, let us be clear, there will be no negotiations whatsoever. The unions and dissidents do not deserve to be heard out, not at the best of times, not, and certainly not now. They have no, two choices, no more, no less. Toe the line or be destroyed under the full force of the law. Why not? Crumbling. Mm. If you want to build this, please go ahead. Tipping your hand. We now have enough clues due to a prior investigation of government control. We just deserve to destroy the CCL. If you read this, please go ahead. Yay! We're really running out of political power, aren't we? Ooh. Everyone about Nintendo, please go ahead. Stage two. China can be allowed to intervene. Well, we'll go with that one, I guess. Breakpoint. Chow found himself on the run again, like many of the times in the past. He'd been on the front lines of the protests, in and amongst all the others that were there with him. The police reinforcements had arrived faster than expected, and they came with more numbers than they thought, but those were no issues. The protesters would continue to disappear into the air, reform again in the future. A few policemen suddenly appeared a few meters in front of him. Baton's out threatening. Not ideal, Chun thought, but not impossible. He paused for a split second, preparing to change his momentum in a completely different direction. And that's when they got him. His face felt his, he felt his face slam into the concrete, a sharp pain pulsing through his nose. It was a tackle from the blind side. A single moment of hesitation, and there he was, kicked to the curb, rapidly surrounded by Kumai's goons. The man in their boots on his back, preventing Chow from raising his face off the ground. He realized he couldn't see the face of the man who did this to him. That officer's voice was indistinct, unclear, but it didn't matter whether it was Japanese or Chinese, police or Kampai Tai, all were equally brutal. There was a sharp crack that rang out through the air. It took a second to process. That one of his bones had broken. A sudden sharp agony came, soon came after, and he was hacked out a useless soundless yell. There wasn't any volume in it, he had no breath left. Before he passed out with the last of his consciousness, he grasped with the words that, it, that told him that he wasn't going to be the only one to suffer like this. Also subdued, neutralized the rest. Complimentary fabrication. Make an example. The writing in grades outside did not understand that the powers that be of Guangdong are above them for the benefit as well as ours. Until it was too late, they continued to fight against their rightful overlords and brought chaos and near ruin to this beautiful country and people. But now it's time to make an object lesson of these good-for-nothing, useless traitors, so as to ensure that no more such incidents will take place in their lifetimes. 
Sure trials be televised all across the state of Guangdong, and evidence shall be presented against the people whose trial to be broadcast. Trial and evidence will be shown in such a way as is most effective in depicting the radical violence of these renegades. A kick and scream after the courts provoke them, but only the kicking and screaming will be shown. And when the guilty verdict is given, it'll be only a matter of time before the great chief executive or his agents send the guillotine blade down on the upstart traitor's necks. Criminals' life and liberty are forfeit. The sooner they understand this, the better. <clears throat> Instinct. Uh, I think I read this one before, too. Fight is mankind's oldest desire. Prisoners? Yeah, there's that one. Stage 2. Remember this one, too? Please go ahead. No, one's bustling, now silent. Nice. Oh crap, beginning the product cycle. No, oh, well. Crud. We'll try our best, but you know. We have more important things to attend to right now than this stuff. Yeah, we're gonna we're really not do well here. Lockdown, tighter, tighter. An advance is a computation of power technology. <clears throat> As you can tell, we're just trying to get through the focus tree here, and then I will probably clean up the rest of this off screen into the next episode, which will be the final lock thing. So, <coughs> excuse me. Oh boy. Oh boy. No negotiations. Not one step back. Come on, I spoke to this cabinet. As always, he would not be defied, but this time the stakes are so much higher than before, and his temper is fluttering up to the match of that. I want to eradicate any and all doubts or suggestions you have about my methods, which are the right methods needed for the correct execution of Guangdong's administration. Let me be perfectly clear. There are no uh, concessions made to subversives and Chinese traders. Absolutely none. Do you hear me? Uh, people nodded awkwardly. Vain surfaced and Kamai's temples as his tone became louder and harsher, continuing, therefore, there is absolutely no question or negotiations. None. And anyone that tries to suggest otherwise will be outside of the government. A fist slammed on the table to drive the point home, while the chief executive has breathed heavily. This time the simple flax, nods, and noises of agreement were so fast that a viewer on TV would think they'd just been pay played in fast forward. As the governor of Guangdong acquiesced to this ruler latest dictate, Kamai regained his cool and sat down heavily. The room was eerily silent. It's not bad. Back to courts. When people in other countries, America, Germany, India, you name it, speak of court packing, they usually mean something in the vein of adding judges to the higher low courts with a view on shifting the balance in a given direction. In Guangdong, on the other hand, we do things in a distinctly different manner. We pack the courts with defendants. Luckily for the poor judges, the system is a conveyor belt. The verdict's already decided, and the stamp of guilt is marked on each case file, for that's what these traitors are, all are. But the government and our honored chief executive both want to see these good-for-nothing ingrates tried and jailed and right quick. So the Guangdong-style court packing will continue pace. Yeah, we're not looking great right now. Right at the edge. Ooh, that's not good. Around the radio, the court had received a decision. The defendants judged guilty and sentenced to death. The words crackled from the radio as the Huang family sat around it. Lee, a man who lived in their apartment building for 20 years, had disappeared three weeks ago. They'd all asked around, but not even his brother knew what happened to Lee. Until they read his name in the morning paper, Lee had been arrested for subversive activities, sedition, and terrorism. The show was being broadcast by the radio, which was the whole family of five had gathered to listen to. When the court's grim decision was read, Mr. Huang looked to the faces of his children, a man they had known, played with, eaten with, being sentenced to death, and yet their faces now held expression at all. No expression at all. To his shock, Mr. Huang realized that neither did his wife nor his his. This is the world they lived in, and they'd all just gotten used to it. A fish does not feel the water. Complimentary fabrication. Our agents and police officers were directed to find the names of any and all ringleaders and people of interest who the government could arrest, charge, and bring to justice. They perform this task with a palm, and our countless assorted rabble rousers, agitators, and subversive agents are held under prisons. But it's just a matter of putting them through the judiciary to be dealt with. Fortunately for us, the judiciary and security services both take great pleasure in taking our orders accordingly. In addition to the evidence of participation and organization of protests, which in and of itself suffices to prove treason, uh, the ringleaders will also be confronted with reams of evidence fabricated against them by the security forces. Just to make extra sure that they are kept where we want them and stand no ex uh, chance of escaping our justice. Pretty much. House always wins. Oh, look, we actually did it. Look at that. Nice.
Why does Dad may never die? The back room was lit only by the TV in the corner, around which the semicircle of the lost wandered, watched the trials of the darned. Lee John's so, uh, shoulders slumped, his hands twisting into knots, praying that he would never see his family on the screen. They knew Hitachi had broadcast these trials to demoralize all of Guangdong, but they couldn't pry their eyes away. Uh, Tian Zilan, terrorism, extensive damage to public property, death by hanging. A uh, side, side behind John, I was expected no, but no less miserable to see him go. Young Jian, incitement to rebellion, arms trafficking to seditious individuals, death by hanging. A wary nod from the woman next to Chun. A wife would now be left without a husband and a son without a father. Chui Kai Hong, treats and murder of the state official, death by hanging, a gas with shuddering sobs, someone left in the room in a hurry. Between Chung's fingers were set old set of old dog tags. They're from an old veteran of the Civil War. He'd been fighting the Japanese all his loved old life, and the last Chun saw of him, he'd been fighting the cops to give Chun time to escape a skirmish. All Song Hao Yun wanted was for Chun to take the dog tags before he fled. He did not appear in these trials. Chun guessed that he was dead. He sure hoped that for every victim of the dock, another time were being shoved into the mass graves. Well, with each name read out, each death sentence proclaimed, the men and women in the room felt a little less fear. For John, for all the CCL, it was victory or death. And if the fate was to be the latter, they would at least try to make as many of the Japanese try to take, it, t take as many of them as they could with them. When he returned to the streets, John put on the old man's dog tags and honored his sacrifice. Pretty much. Pretty much. Manchurian Justice. The rank of the accused and guilty swelled under Hitachi and made sure that they were enough to court the system to try them all. Or enough courts to try them all. Wherever there was a grand enough hall, special courts were raised to render swift rulings. Hall of Face line of the accused found, found themselves in a purpose boardrooms of a Chung Kong subsidiary, squeezed into insolvency by Hitachi. Further, there was a stern, moon faced judge with pursed lips and small eyes magnified through his glasses. He introduced himself as Judge Moruya, laid off at Siking's court and issued verdicts with speed. Those that stood before him were all given the same judgment guilty, guilty, guilty. All 60 were done in 90 minutes. Yoshiko etched down their names and crimes into the notebook with mechanical detachment. At times, she would scribble down a quick comment, often the state of the accused, as they were hauled to the dock, bruised, shaking, arm, and sling. The crimes ranged from vandalism to the treason, all married in the same sentence. There was no defense attorney to plead for clemency, only a prosecutor to read the charges and a judge to proclaim them guilty. The judge announced that sentencing them would be carried out that afternoon, and Yoshiko thought how efficient, or how inefficient, actually. They have saved time, or they let this judge proclaim both verdicts and the sentence. She closed her notebook and drifted away from the courtroom. She knew that she could not speak out. Honestly, would only see her added to the line of dead before the court. She could only report on it as plainly as possible. Fully aware of the dispassionate reporting only started to deteriorate its public morale, just as Hitachi wanted. No, she couldn't attend sensing. She knew what it was going to be. Everyone did. I played this game best. No one but no one is capable of outsmarting her esteemed chief executive. Kamal Kenichiro, chairman of the Hitachi Corporation, promoter of the glorious Manchurian plan, chair defender and preserver of the great beauty and strength of the state of Guangdong. The rights have been crushed under his iron boot. The treasonous revolutionaries are either in prison or have dis dissipated back into the unknown lower masses. The population looks upon Kamai with fear and reverence, as is her right duty. As the nation heals and falls into a dull, awkward sense of calm, the government and its esteemed leader drink to the health and beauty of the nation. A dry and proper, after all, the crises have ended and order has been restored. Justice is not a function of morality, but a strength. The criminals have never had a chance. Nice. You try to smell them again. Let me see if you're two, one out. I'm kind of surprised we actually did get the CCL done, too. Complementary fabrication. Due process. One of Lem's intents was carrying a stack of papers high enough to reach his chin. Lem watched him go and crack a small smile. Some secretary was about to have a really bad day. He took a sip of coffee and turned away, only to roll back as a lieutenant dumped the massive stack on his desk. What Lem said, failing miserably to hide his apollo tone. Confession record, confession record forms, the lieutenant said, shaking out his arms. The jails are overflowing. We need to fire these cases through the courts as quickly as possible. Do I have to observe all these, I'm asked? Already feeling sick, interrogation sessions tend to be violent and end with a lot of blood. If nothing else, it's almost impossible to clean up the uniform. You're not observing any of them, the lieutenant replied, chuckling without mirth. You're just riding them. We don't have time for the procedure. The courts will never believe this land began weakly, but the lieutenant couldn't un over him. The courts will accept whatever we give them. We've been assured of this. As I said, I don't, we don't have time for procedure. We need these riders off the streets and in prisons as soon as possible. If we have to sacrifice the legal procedure to do that, then that's what we're going to have to do. Now get it done. Time on our short hands. Nice. So where are we at? No, that's a bit too high. So we need seven and a half. We need that. 
Six hundred, huh? Mm, not quite. No Japanese frustration would be good. Good cop, bad cop. Mm. Cracking the facade. Double check his connections, I guess, you know. Just specimens, huh? Oh, whatever. Seven and a half, huh? There you go. I play the game the best. It is finished. Transcript. Get the downs off the street. We can try that one again. It's finished. No day went by in Guangdong without the protests, of course. Thousands of unruly rioters are still on the streets trying their level best to bring down the entire government altogether. Men are still filled with the same rage, the same fear that caused the entire mess to begin with, but now there's something different. A few weeks ago, the government centers in the 3D pearls was practically war zones, ground zero in the conflict. They're not closer to the citadels. Every single square inch in these places were now always watched by the faceless uniformed men. It was these men who fought, who caught unawares in the beginning, but that had changed. Police and Kenpachi alike were more equipped, more experienced, and certainly more ruthless. Against finer opposition, the protesters stumbled. Slowly, they found themselves pushed further away from the real places of power where all the anger in the world wouldn't cause as much damage as they had in the past. Come on, I saw for all this from the balcony. The slogans, always shouted at full volume, were absent. The graffiti was slowly being painted over. The riders were being dealt with, dead or in prison, it didn't matter. All across the night sky, the lights were on again, a sign as sure as any that things were normal again. Took a satisfying puff from his cigarette, examined the city under him. A small smirk formed in the corner of his mouth. Yes, the rank smell of smoke and filth was incredibly pervasive, and there was so much to repair. But the chaos was over, and Kim Wai Kenneth Sure was the one who ended it. Spiral. And. That's this one. Spiral. <coughs> The bell rang and Lamb staggered in the break room. He closed his eyes and collapsed on other station's cots, warm and stinking from constant use. Screams and visions of violence entered his mind, broken bones, shattered jaws, and burning buildings all revolving around him like a pack of demons. He watched himself from above. A rider screamed at him, called him a traitor, a whore for the Japanese. He watched himself swing a baton, full force in the rider's neck with a sickening crunch. The rider fell and didn't get up again. From here, it didn't look like self defense. As this helmeted monster carved his way through the hordes of desperate civilians, who is he? He wonders dully, watching himself beat and kill and maim. If only he could stop, but the police were terrified of infiltrators, and so their service pistols were all locked away until the next time they had to go out and kill more people. But would he do it? If he had his gun in his belt right now, would he put it to his head and pull the trigger? No. Cowardice, self-preservation. The realization that his own death would be meaningless, and Hitachi's infernal engine would roll on, with or without him. When the riders came from, he refuses to die. He fights to defend himself. When he's alone, with nobody there but him and the gun in his hand, he's too scared. Such is the curse of all the Zujin and Guangdong, Kamaya's rabbit hounds sent into the streets to spill blood and destroy lives. No way out. Because why would you want to weigh out? Um, let me lower this. Decrease strength. Ah, do that one. Screw it. We need a small one for five. Transit point. God dang it, that we failed. Well deserved rest. The each have been awake for 30 hours. The last drop of adrenaline in the system dissolved. Uh, oh no, I've read this one before, so if you know this one, please read it. Well, I'm going to end that episode here. So then, in the beginning of the next episode, <clears throat> we'll be ready to read about how successful we were with the riot. So, if you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you what else we can do with the riots, or at least read about the personal staff. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.